We all inherently understand that water is essential to life. We drink, bathe, cook, and dispose of waste with it every day. But water is critical to society in many ways you may not realize. You need water to make just about anything, from growing food to making raw materials like steel, cement, paper, or plastic, to manufacturing of all goods, including the clothes you're wearing and the screen on which you're viewing this talk. For example, a cup of coffee requires 140 liters of water, and a smartphone, more than 12,000. Water is even needed to generate electricity. Because we use water for almost all human activity, as society continues to develop, our demand for water is going to skyrocket. With water being so vital, it's important to ask, where is all the water on Earth? We are fortunate to have a planet with a tremendous amount of water on it, millions of billions of liters in total. But 97% of this is in the oceans. And you can't use salt water to drink or grow food or manufacture goods. Of the 3% or so of the water on Earth that is fresh, more than half is locked up in the ice caps and glaciers inaccessible to us. Almost all of the rest is under our feet in aquifers, so-called groundwater. Now, we are heavily reliant on groundwater. We withdraw it much more rapidly than it's naturally replenished. This creates an unsustainable dynamic that will exhaust this resource before long. Both India and the United States get more than half of our water for irrigation from groundwater. How will all that food be grown once those aquifers run dry? What about surface water, lakes, and rivers? Well, all together, those equal only about 0.007% of the water on Earth. Yikes, right? And that tiny supply is becoming even more stressed because of climate change. Precipitation patterns are changing, in many cases making already dry regions even drier. Water crises like the one that happened in Cape Town, South Africa in 2017 or Chennai in 2019 will only become more common in the coming years. As sea level rises, salt water will start to intrude into coastal freshwater aquifers and perhaps most alarmingly, the glaciers and snow whose meltwater feeds river systems on which billions of peoples rely are disappearing. Water crises are perhaps most pressing in South Asia, where India, the largest economy, faces severe shortages and almost no consensus on what to do about it. Water problems threaten to hinder India's economic growth and slow its rise as a regional power. India is not alone. Many developing countries face similar challenges. And water often crosses political boundaries. This forces governments to try and work together to figure out how much water each side can use. Water sharing has always been difficult. More than 4,500 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia, there were two neighboring city-states of Uma and Lagash, and they bickered constantly over a tributary from the Euphrates River. Eventually, a water sharing agreement was brokered, the Treaty of Messaline. This was not only the world's first water treaty, it was actually the first recorded treaty of any kind. This speaks to the centrality of water in human civilization. Unfortunately, however, that peace between Uma and Lagash devolved into conflict just 50 years later, starting the world's first, but certainly not its last, water war. Today, in a time of accelerating economic change and climate disruption, tensions like these are exacerbated. South Asia is reliant on water from two sources, ice and snowmelt from the Himalayan plateau and the annual monsoon rains. Both of these sources are destined to become more unpredictable and unreliable going forward. Moreover, there's already a large regional dependence on groundwater, which is unsustainable, so this cannot be expanded to provide additional supply. Without significant reforms to the way that South Asian nations use and manage water, they and many other regions around the world will face deepening economic and social turbulence. There just won't be enough water to go around 
for sanitation and growing food and cooling machinery. The outlook feels pretty darn bleak. So what do we do? Fortunately, developing countries have some powerful tools available to address water scarcity and enable sustainable economic development. This involves combining two essential elements that must come together as an integrated solution. The first of these is cooperation. South Asia is both a model of international water agreements and an example of budding water conflict. The Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan and the Mekong River Commission in Southeast Asia have both survived decades of interstate conflict. But contrast that with the case of the Brahmaputra River, which starts in the Tibetan area and flows through China, Bhutan, India, and Bangladesh, and there is little agreement over its governance. So first, we must build on the success of agreements like the Indus Treaty and strengthen these institutions that govern transboundary rivers. This isn't just about India. There are nearly 150 countries around the world that have international river basins in their territory. And I should mention many aquifers also cross political boundaries. Creating an impartial and credible forum to address water disputes will go a long way toward reducing these political tensions. So first we must have cooperation, but governments must also bring the second piece of the story, which is promoting more efficient water use. And this will be through the encouragement of the development and adoption of water saving and water recycling technologies. An obvious step to take is to shift to more water efficient irrigation methods, less flood irrigation and more drip irrigation. But there are emerging opportunities for novel ideas in water. There is an explosion of research discovery in new water technologies around the world. Some of the most exciting of these entail taking polluted wastewater and returning it to fit for purpose water without relying on the slow natural water cycle to do this. Recycling water in this way represents a complete reimagining of the water cycle and maybe the most sustainable, impactful path to a secure water future. Now, addressing water crises in the developing world through technology will require a change in perspective from those of us in the scientific community. Low cost, highly scalable and distributed systems will be the key rather than the high tech centralized solutions that we employ so often in the developed world. Let me give you a few examples of some of these new water technologies with this different flavor of water recycling. The first example is called solar steam generation. The idea here is that you take the light from the sun, you convert it to thermal energy, and you concentrate all of that heat right at the top of a bath of polluted water. This will dramatically increase the rate of evaporation, leaving the pollutants behind. You can then just capture the steam, allow it to condense, and you've got clean water fit for almost any use, all driven by a plentiful and carbon-free energy source. The materials for solar steam generation cost almost nothing, and these devices can be deployed almost anywhere, as long as there's enough sunlight. Another example comes from the world of membrane technology. Membranes are filters with tiny pores that allow the water to pass but block the unwanted substances. And they're a great way to clean water, but there is a pervasive challenge with membranes, which is that those unwanted substances will often block the pores, not allowing the water to pass, a process called fouling. Here again, we can turn to the sun for help. Researchers are developing specialized coatings that you can apply to membranes that are activated by light. It creates reactive species that degrade those fouling substances, washing them off the surface. So your membrane, when it gets dirty, can literally clean itself as long as it's exposed to light. These are just two examples among a plethora of promising water technologies emerging on the horizon. It may sound like I'm asking you to rely on hope, but we don't have to rely on hope. We have precedent. There are dry places on earth today that have combined technology and water sharing to produce sustainable water management. In an era of growing regional tensions and a changing climate, this integration of water cooperation and technology research and development as a coupled solution is a powerful tool, a smart investment for a secure water future for South Asia, for the rest of the developing world, and for us all. Thank you.